Hello, I'm Gwen Eiffel, and welcome to the Washington Week Webcast Extra. I'm joined around the table by Yoki Driesen of Foreign Policy Magazine, John Harwood of CNBC, Alexis Simendinger of Real Clear Politics, and Michael Crowley of Time Magazine. We continue now with our conversation of how the world's foreign policy problems are roosting on the White House's front door. Let's talk about a few of the issues that may not be on the front page but are still percolating. Beginning with Afghanistan, Michael, we, that could have easily gone awry. Uh, it's kind of mind-boggling with everything seems to be melting down around the world and I think more than a lot of people realize Afghanistan where we have been at war since uh, late 2001 thousands of Americans have died thousands more have been injured we've poured tens of billions of dollars uh, in, into this effort that uh, really appeared to be headed for a civil war because of a disputed presidential election uh, and I did a story for Time.com where I interviewed several uh, administration officials who were intimately involved in the process of brokering a political deal, and that was John Kerry, who went into Kabul en route from China to Vienna for the Iran nuclear talks, so trying to do the pivot to Asia, headed to this Iran situation, diverts into Kabul, spends three days there. Uh, he was told there was a strong opinion within the administration, don't bother going, it's not going to work, the candidates are dug in. Crucially, the president had called uh, key figures in Afghanistan and threatened to cut off American aid if they couldn't reach a deal. That was an important piece of leverage, but Kerry went in there, uh, and as I described, uh, uh, working from relationships that he had developed over many years, going back to when he was in the Senate, was able to bring them together to an, an agreement where there will be an audit of the election ballots uh, after many charges that there were fraudulent ballots, that the election was essentially totally rigged in favor of uh, Hamid Karzai's favored candidate. Uh, they've come together, they've talked about it, they've worked out a power, power sharing arrangement and uh, crisis averted for now. Uh, there are some skeptics who think it may not stick and we may still be headed to a, for a meltdown in Afghanistan, but at least one thing off the uh, ulcer list. list for now at the White House. Well, there's a long ulcer list and, and the president actually came out this week and, and he didn't call it that, but he kind of spoke about the ulcer list. This is what he said. I think I'll point out the obvious. Uh, we live in a complex world and at a challenging time. And none of these challenges lend themselves to quick or easy solutions, but all of them require American leadership. And as Commander-in-Chief, I'm confident that if we stay patient and determined, uh, that we will, in fact, meet these challenges. Okay, let's talk about one of the other big challenges, Iran, the Iran talks, which Michael alluded to, Yoki. There's some movement on that, at least moving it down the road. Right, and, and it was literally as we were about to come on air that they announced an extension, a further extension for another four months of an already extended series of talks. At this point, both the U.S. and Iran and Europe are so invested in these talks that they'll keep extending it as long as they humanly can. Right now, the deal is they've frozen enrichment, so the U.S. can say we've accomplished something. Iran is not enriching anymore, centrifuges are not spinning, but they're nowhere close, really fundamentally not close on a deal. They're not close on how long a deal should be, Iran says seven years, the U.S. says 10 or 20 years. Iran says we will keep some facilities open, the U.S. says they all have to close. Iran says we maintain the right to have industrial level centrifuge enrichment, the U.S. says you can't. So there's a lot of happy talk coming out from Vienna about it's made progress, the gaps are narrowing, we believe there's a deal in sight. But we shouldn't lose sight. These gaps are very, very significant and very far reaching. You know, one of, not too long ago, one of the big front burner issues, uh, Alexis, was Syria. And this week we saw that President Assad was happily sworn into his third seven-year term, even though we've been calling for him. A lot of U.S. capital was put on the line calling for him to step aside. He's not going anywhere. Does the White House see this as having been a failure on their part? Oh, there's no concession that it's been a failure on their part. In fact, uh, at the White House, the administration is trying to stress that the um, concern about Iraq is very much a, a side uh, story to the concerns about what's happening in Syria and the idea of the rise of ISIS and the the need to maybe try to help arm or train rebels, the idea of sending U.S. troops into Iraq. Um, there is, you know, we would have been talking about this except that so many other things are, are going on. But in terms of the White House, there is no concession that this has been a, a, f a failure. It's more discussion about uh, Assad's and his, his desire to what what he's willing to do with against his own people. I will say, Gwen, in, in the conversation I had with the Israeli ambassador yesterday, he was talking about the importance to Israel of the 
agreement on chemical weapons, which was struck with Assad. Now, that paradoxically had the effect of uh, making it easier for Assad to remain in power because he became our partner in the, uh, in the uh, dismantlement of those chemical weapons. But at least uh, from the standpoint of Israel, and the administration claims this as well, uh, they can point to that as a success, if not the success. What about Iraq? Has that now been, uh, I mean, that we were talking about that, what happened with ISIS, what we now call ISIL or whatever we're calling the Islamic State, and the name changes right. every couple of days. That is still percolating, and that has not still been resolved. You know, it, it's, I lived in Iraq for close to four years, and we forget post-World War I, countries that existed didn't, countries that didn't exist did. Post-World War II, same dynamic. We forget that. It happens again and again and again. The border between Iraq and Syria is never coming back, never. It was barely there in the first place. It was drawn on a map in the first place, but it's gone. So whatever this new state is, whether it's an Islamic state, whether it's a Sunni state that's modern and secular, whatever it is, it's there for real. It's there for good. The border is not coming back. These states will never be as divided as they once were. And we the should Kurdish not decide The Kurdish state will that. always remain the Kurdish state. It will be an effective partitioning, too. We, another, the dynamics just get more fascinating. Turkey always thought we will never allow an independent Kurdish state. Now the Kurds say to them, we're the buffer between those crazy bearded jihadis, those Arabs you don't want. We're the buffer between them and you. So now Turkey is softening when it comes to independence. Joe Biden's Fast. vision coming true? Exactly. Joe Biden just seven or eight years later. Not everyone agrees. I talked to a former very senior Bush administration official who spent a lot of time in Iraq, and he, he actually chastised uh, Time magazine, a story that I wrote. The cover was the end of Iraq, and he said, I think you guys jumped the gun. I think you're going to, he was good natured, but I think you're going to regret it. I think it's going to hold together. Um, it's still in the Kurds' economic interest to stay uh, as part of Iraq. They would be giving up a lot of oil revenues if they did that. Uh, he uh, thinks that it's quite likely that Maliki will go, that the, uh, there has been some recent pro progress in the political process there. Uh, and I talked to um, a, a, a regional Arab government official who also was kind of sanguine about the situation and kind of felt like the, the, that uh, the Baghdad was going to get its act together, that ISIS was 10,000 guys. Um, they're not going to go much farther than they are. So uh, there may be some reasons for optimism. You know, a, a, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, it looked like a total cataclysm and kind of the end of the world. It's obviously not a good situation. but. Um, it's possible that there's kind of a muddle through that's not a complete disaster at this Maliki point. Maliki will go and Assad will stay and the world remains a confusing place. Thank you <laughs> Lovely all place. very much. That's <laughs> it for now. We'll see you next time on the Washington Week Webcast Extra.